Radio Mises, avsnitt 53. Today's episode will be in English, because we have a very special guest with us. Some of you may have heard his name before. Actually, I suspect almost all of you know who he is, and many of you will have read his books. Uh, you might also be regular listeners to his radio show. He is the author of 12 books, including The Politically Incorrect Guide to American History, 33 Questions About American History You're Not Supposed to Ask, Meltdown, How the Catholic Church Built Western Civilization, Nullification, and most recently, Real Dissent, A Libertarian Sets Fire to the Index Card of Allowable Opinion. He is a senior fellow at the Ludwig von Mises Institute, holds a bachelor's degree in history from Harvard, and he runs the Tom Woods Show, which has now reached its 413th episode. We are delighted to have with us none other than Tom Woods. Hello, Tom. Hello, gentlemen. How are you? We are just fine. So happy to have you with us. Thank you. It's, it's miraculous, the technology that makes this possible. Not only are we speaking, but the audio is crystal clear and there's no delay. So even the telephone technology that we once found amazing seems ridiculous and outmoded today. Yeah, I remember those delays for a second or a half second that made it almost impossible to speak. Right, you're always talking over each other and it's awkward and nothing ever gets done. So I'm thrilled to be here, particularly through this medium. I, I seem to remember the prize of doing long distance calls. That was horrific. Uh, and, and of course, we're doing this for, for free. <laughs> this call doesn't cost us a cent. Anyway, right. yeah. miracles around and yet, and yet everybody spends all day complaining. Yeah. So first topic, Tom, you have a new book out called Real Descent. Could you tell us a bit about that? The premise of the book is, has to do with the United States and the way political discourse, such as it is, takes place. I can't speak for Sweden. I suspect that the, the whole discourse is farther to the left in Sweden than it is in the United States. But the, the drift of my book is that the political class behaves as if there is a three-by-five card on which all the allowable opinions are written out. The media is complicit in this, too. So if you stray from that very, very narrow range of allowable opinion, you will be ignored. And if you are not ignored, you will be not refuted, but simply smeared and dismissed without a refutation, simply because by the mere act of betraying the sacred card, uh, you have shown yourself un, unworthy of a, of a refutation. You don't deserve a refutation. So in the United States, for example, the spectrum of opinion that's allowable on foreign policy is very, very narrow. You have to accept all the premises of American foreign policy. You have to accept that the, the United States is going to have a very substantial overseas presence. It's going to have uh, many, many military bases. It's going to have troops in many, many countries, well over a hundred, and it's going to intervene for various reasons, either for allegedly humanitarian reasons or for reasons of national interest. But uh, certainly you can debate whether humanitarian so-called reasons are more pressing than others, but you can't question the whole system because then that's not responsible. Don't you understand that the whole debate occurs on this little card? <laughs> so yeah. that's... That's been true of what, whether you're talking about monetary policy, you can say that the Federal Reserve is doing not such a good job in this or that way, but you can't say we don't need a Federal Reserve. Or, or you could say the income tax may be a little bit too high, but you can't really say we, we shouldn't have an income tax. Now, there are people who will say we shouldn't have an income tax, we should instead have a national sales tax. The regime is pretty much okay with that because it would be the same amount of money being taken, so they don't really care one way or the other. So the point is, this is how all of political discussion takes place in the U.S. And if by accident an American politician just happens to fall into a truth-telling moment, uh, if he just happens to say something that's not on the card and, of course, is also truthful, within 24 hours that statement will be officially retracted. Uh, everyone will pounce. No one will, sh will explain where he's wrong. Again, you don't get a refutation. You are ipso facto wrong because you strayed from the card. And we have a, a weird, almost liturgical ceremony that takes place of, of expiation and, and sorrow and, and penance for the person who accidentally said something that might be true. It is always, I'm deeply sorry, I've offended people, 
uh, and this and that. Uh, the other day, an, an, there was an actor, I can't remember his name, who said that he's about to go out on a promotional tour for his new movie, and he was poking fun at this solemn religious ceremony we have in the U.S. for uh, that politicians who tell the truth have to go through. And he said that, I, in advance, I apologize to anybody I will inadvertently offend over the course of this tour for my movie. And it was great because that's, that's exactly what we all have to endure. And no one takes it seriously. We're all rolling our eyes. We're all wondering when's it going to be over. Nobody takes it seriously. E- even the people who are doing it, who are, who are, who are pressing the issue on the offending person, they all know what it's all about. They, they, nobody really takes it seriously. Nobody actually thinks the guy intended anything bad or hates people or whatever the accusation is. They just know this is the way American life works. So what I did in, in Real Descent was to just act as if there were no card. And I just, you know, I talked about the, the possibility of American foreign policy of of peace and non-intervention. I talked about an American economy without a Federal Reserve. I talked about uh, a United States without the current regulatory apparatus. So I don't confine myself to the narrow range of opinion that's normally allowed. I just have at it. And that's why I happen to think this is my, I personally think it's the best book I've done. It's my favorite. And it's the first one that I've done completely I, I just I self published it. I, I did it on my own. I, oh, I've right. been published with some fairly big publishers in the U.S. in the past. But I thought, what the heck? It seems like the fashionable thing these days is to try out self publishing. So I tried my hand at it, and so far it has been such a success that it makes me wonder if I would ever use a traditional publisher again. Is it print on demand or is it? Uh... It is print on demand. Although the way I priced it, it's twenty dollars for the print edition, but it's only four U.S. dollars for the Kindle. So most Ah. people are just getting the Kindle, which, of course, is available on demand because it's not even a physical thing. Hmm. And so most people are getting it in the Kindle version. And I'm perfectly happy. I mean, $4 is a reasonable price, I think. And and, uh, I think you'll get a lot of enjoyment out of it. I mean, the idea of it is it's going to give you a lot of ammunition in debates that you yourself may have on all sorts of topics related to the free market and the free society. But it's also sort of punchily written, if I may put it that way, so that I think you would actually enjoy the process of reading. It's not just a matter of absorbing material, but I think you'll enjoy the presentation too. Because uh, incidentally, a lot of it is is a series of responses that I've written to critics of libertarianism. There are certainly uh, there may not be so many of them in Sweden because the libertarian movement is smaller there, but in the U.S., where it's been gaining so much steam. Well, everyone's come out of the woodwork to be critical of libertarianism, and sometimes their arguments are just so terrible. It shows they haven't read anything that we've written. They don't realize we've answered all these things many times over, many decades uh, uh, before. So I sort of came to specialize in responses to these kinds of criticisms, and I have a whole section of the book that compiles all those responses, and people seem to like those. So if, if you like seeing... It's not to say that you can't have a, an honest, goodwill objection to libertarianism or, or a legitimate concern. I'm not talking about people like that. I'm talking about people who are clearly of bad will, who are clearly trying to distort and smear us. If you like seeing bad guys like that get what's coming to them, then you'll enjoy that <laughs> section of the book. Yeah. I mean, that brings me to my second question. How is libertarianism doing in the U.S.? I mean, in, in Sweden, it's a very small fringe movement. But it seems to be gaining traction in the United States. It does. And the question will be, does it continue to gain traction without the central organizing figure of Ron Paul uh, to rally around? Now, of course, Ron is still around. He turns 80 this year. But he has a YouTube program that he's started up, the Ron Paul Liberty Report. And he's got his hand in a lot of things. He has a foreign policy institute. He's got a homeschool curriculum, which I've designed courses for uh, at ronpaulhomeschool.com. So he, and he does a lot of public speaking. But there isn't as much interest in – this is just – this was bound to happen, and he knew it. There's not as much intense interest in what he's doing when he's not delivering speeches on the floor of the House of Representatives and, and, and running for, for president. Because there are a lot of people who are interested only during a political campaign season or only when – there's some political issue before the, the House. Yeah. And when it's that's just bit, an ordinary day-to-day activity, people just lose interest. That's a bit sad, isn't it, though, uh, that the ideas are 
mainly interesting if you have you know, a direct connection to what is happening right now. That's true. Now, on the other hand, when Ron goes to give speeches, he's getting packed houses with thousands of people. So th- there is still a, a level of enthusiasm there, but it's just the nature of things that it, it may not be as intense as it was before. So we have to see, given that he was the, the conduit for so much energy and, and young people's interest in libertarianism, can that persist? Now, uh, uh, there are a lot of institutions that are promoting it, but those institutions were around for many years, and we didn't see this explosion in growth. But at the same time, the Internet makes possible the spreading of heterodox views, so that will continue to happen. And there are, although there are a lot of young people who I personally think because of their rotten educations are naturally tending in the progressive direction, and, and I say that, by the way, I say it's because of their rotten education, because I think the default position for anybody is to be a progressive. The default position is, well, let's see, we have poor people here and we have things over there. Let's give the things to the poor people. It solves the problem. I mean, you know, that does seem plausible, right? So you have to be or, or we have a big company and that's bad. So we need antitrust. There are all kinds of things that seem plausible that are actually problematic and you don't really get to understand why they're problematic until you really think about it. You get exposed to different ideas. They're not getting exposed to that. But on the other hand, there are among younger people uh, uh, certainly way far more interested in libertarianism uh, than we've ever seen. And and certainly the, the idea that people would be talking about Rothbard and Mises fairly regularly is something I personally couldn't have imagined 10 years ago. So we have to be careful not to expect too much and be too discouraged in the short run. Question here for you, a personal one. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, the spectrum of allowable opinion is pretty narrow in Sweden too. <laughs> yeah, it's probably even narrower. I would say I, it's I like a one by one be. card. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought it would be. And there are a few topics that are more uh, infected than others, uh, like um, immigration, state-sponsored immigration, uh, gender issues, and um, uh, usually what people get called they get called nazis or fascist or something like that and then oh that's yeah see we we get we get fascist thrown around a lot here too and i might note from a point of view of sweden a couple of quick things related to my own daily podcast that you mentioned i've noted that the podcast has been downloaded in 140 countries so for but as many countries as have U.S. troops also have the Tom Woods show, as it turns out. <laughs> <laughs> same countries? I, I don't know if it's precisely the same. But uh, anyway, I, I, so I wanted to see what are the countries that listen to it the most. And of course, you know, the English-speaking countries are the, 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 the first few. But coming in at number five is Sweden. Wow. Yeah. Did wow. you know we have less than 10 million uh, inhabitants in this country? I knew so, it was small. I didn't know. So that, that is even more impressive, isn't it? Yeah. As a percentage of the population, apparently we are, we are your top listeners. Yeah, you may be the top. Now, that, that's very revealing. And what's also interesting to me is one of my most listened to episodes had to do with the Swedish welfare state because all over the world, progressives use the Swedish welfare state as a bludgeon yeah. to beat laissez-faire people to say, well, look, what's the matter with you? Interventionism seems to work just fine in Sweden. So I devoted an episode to that topic, and it was just such a successful episode. Everybody in the U.S. wanted to listen to it because they're sick and tired of having this used against them. And then uh, you mentioned fascism, so I did an episode on fascism to talk about what fascism actually is. And I think I called the episode, What Fascism Really Is. And it's not just anything you happen to dislike. Really? Because, of course, <laughs> you know, yeah, it, it, about, how about that? There actually is a definition of fascism. It's not yeah. just hey, everybody who thinks the welfare budget should be cut by 3.7%. You know, that it actually has a meaning. Yeah. Sweden has its very own definition of fascism, and it's so broad that uh, everyone will accidentally step into it all the time. So, yeah, that's right. <laughs> this is a fascist show. <laughs> yeah, no yeah. doubt. Right, of course. How would you define it in two sentences? Well, I mean, it, it does seem to have different manifestations in different countries. Uh, that's for sure. There's obviously a difference between Italian and German fascism. But I would say it is an ideology based on anti-individualism and anti-liberalism. It's a collectivist idea that's based on the idea of the state as the central organizing principle of society and of the nation as being 
the spiritual embodiment of the people and the people's destiny. And it tends to be militaristic because that's, of course, how the nation will have a role for itself in the world and express itself. Culture, economy, all these things are directed in a nationalist direction. Regionalism, local particularisms, all these things are looked down upon. And in place of that, we have the central organizing principle of the state. What we're missing in Sweden is the militaristic um, component, but I think we're getting there with the, with the EU. Would you say that the, the US is a fascist state then, according to that definition? Well, I, I want to be super careful about this. I mean, there, there are people, for example, like in U.S. history, John T. Flynn, who was a very harsh critic of President Franklin Roosevelt, who really brought the, the really, really significant tradition of government intervention into the economy uh, to the United States. John T. Flynn wrote a book called As We Go Marching, and he had uh, one or two other books that are related to this in which he tried to draw parallels between the fascist regimes and the United States. I would say there are some elements of it, but there are also some ele elements that are missing. There certainly is no, uh, in the United States, you don't see some identification of the, let's say, the original physical stock of the people and saying that these, because uh, of course, uh, fascism identifies the Italian people with the state or German with Germany it's the German people if you were to make an appeal like that in the United States you would never be heard from again but you you would never be heard from again and I, I consider that to be one of the key ingredients of fascism is the idea of a nationalism based on race and ethnicity and to the yeah. contrary the US bases its interventions on the idea that uh, there is no race or, race or ethnicity. We are the international people who are purely looking out for the international common good. Now, I, I think that's a laughable proposition, but that's the way they couch it, and that so that is a major difference. Good. I think we should get into um, the topic of history. Maybe I can start. Yeah. Uh, relating to this, uh, in Sweden, uh, we have, I would say, we have two favorite kings. Uh, we have uh, Gustav the First who sort of, he, he's known for uniting the country. It was a very decentralized country. He united the country in the 16th century. Of course, he did a lot of violence and atrocities and so on. And the second favorite king is Charles XII, who was the last ruler of our sort of uh, brief imperial period. He waged a lot of wars and he, he lost a lot of men and he cost a lot of money and the nation was basically bankrupt after him. And printed a lot of money. Yeah, I printed oh, a lot of money. Oh, how about that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We actually have these copper coins that are like, what, 20 kilos large old copper coins. We find, found a huge copper mine in Sweden. So he started minting uh, copper coins like a madman uh, to pay for everything. But why do people love these kings? Why do people love leaders, the great leaders of history, when in fact, you know, common people starved and died under them? Well, this is one of the most discouraging facts of all. It makes you despair of having any success when uh, you, you feel that these things should be obvious to people and yet they're not and and moreover because of the poison of nationalism what everyone else views to be a tyrant is your great national liberator to you whether it's i mean you could just go on and on with possible names here but when we think of in in american history for example we i we have the case of abraham lincoln and if anybody else anywhere in the world launched a war on his own people in, in which we now know, according to current figures, about 860,000 people died, we would say, oh, my goodness, he was waging war on his own people. That would be the way it would be put because that's the way it was put in the case of Saddam Hussein. Now, of course, I'll get in trouble. He's saying Abraham Lincoln is like Saddam Hussein. Th that's the intellectual level of most people who raise <laughs> How we, we know. <laughs> yeah, but, but that's how they would put it. But in the case of Americans, they say, well, he was our great uh, national consolidator. He was, the, he was the one who gave us our unbreakable union. Well, I, that's the way they, they, they look at things. Now, at the same time, and there's also a prejudice in favor of centralization. So we look in history, we look at the 19th century, and we say it was a great progressive thing that Germany was centralized and, it, and Italy was centralized. But, and, and, you know, there are certainly, there are certainly some efficiencies that, come, that can come from centralization if that's your primary concern. But 
maybe I wanted the German state to be a little bit more inefficient in the 20th century. And yet, and yet no one even pauses to think, huh, maybe the history of the 20th century would have been a lot different if we hadn't had the unification of Germany. How about that? But we don't consider that because the unification of Germany is considered a historical imperative. It must occur because we're taught to believe that centralization is progressive and bold and decentralization is backward and stupid. And that's not to say that there wasn't backwardness in the days of decentralization. Certainly there was. It's not like the case for centralization was so preposterous that no one would ever possibly accept it. It's because it did have a, a grain of truth to it that people rallied to it. But I think the, the key reason that people look to leaders like the ones you mentioned is, that, is the way they wind up being portrayed because they do win the day, they are successful. Well, historians tend to be flatterers, I find. The, the historian is very rarely the hanging judge. The historian tends to go with the flow and historians happen to like centralization. And they portray the new, wonderful world of ours as so much better and progressive and forward-looking than the old world that, that we used to have. And, of course, in the case of Sweden, you did have some attempted resistance uh, against Gustav. There were people who didn't, want, who didn't want Protestantism forced on them, who wanted to maintain their old ways, who wanted to just to continue uh, their, their normal channels of trade, and their, their normal economic activities. They didn't want, they didn't want this. And these are the people who, you know, for some people remember them as heroes and others want to, to smear them. I mean, at least today we can watch Braveheart and have some sympathy for people who are resisting centralizers. At least that we have a, a, a little bit of that uh, thanks to Mel Gibson, but unfortunately not nearly enough. But they say it was good back then, but today it's different. So our, our uh, resistor that you mentioned is uh, Nils Dacke, uh, one of the most important ones. And he uh, is kind of the Swedish Braveheart in a way because he... Yeah, that was, that was the, that's the guy I had in mind. In fact. Yeah, he basically beat the king and uh, the king tricked him and uh, uh, didn't stay, stick to his promises. And yeah, see, I mean, and that, it reminds me, reminds me of uh, in England, there was the, the so-called Pilgrimage of Grace uh, back around uh, late 1530s into 1540, I think. And the idea there was that they were people were unhappy at various things that Henry VIII was up to, and they wanted to hold on to their old ways. And they launched this pilgrimage of grace, and they, they could probably have taken London. And the king made promises that if they just go home and disarm, uh, he will listen to their grievances, and none of them will get in trouble. And of course, as soon as they disarmed, they were all arrested and executed. <laughs> so I mean, like, uh, you know, it's unbelievable today that you could have thought so fondly of your king that you uh, would do that but indeed it's a it's a sad pattern uh, in an american context uh, is the centralization of the u.s a good thing would it have, it have been better if the states would never have joined to become the united states of america um do you think well, this is a question a lot of us think about, and that's what makes us so different. It's a question that nobody thinks about in the U.S. If you look on Facebook, for example, sometimes when, when we're looking at presidential candidates, for example, people will say, let's look at how many likes they have on Facebook as some kind of a rough estimate of how much grassroots enthusiasm there is for these people. Well, likewise, what if we look at the number of likes that the U.S. Constitution has? I mean, it's millions and millions. I don't know how many. But then we look at the number of likes that the Articles of Confederation, the document that preceded the U.S. Constitution, has, and I think it's less than 500. <laughs> now, it could be that the Articles of Confederation was just so obviously inferior that that's just the way the numbers would naturally go. But, I, you know, this issue was far too controversial at that time for it to be so cut and dried. This is obviously because this is how every school child learns the matter. This is how it's taught to everyone. It's not even taught to them that there was another way of thinking about it. So naturally, we all just learn, even though it's a, obviously a matter of opinion, we, we write it down in our notebooks as if it's a matter of fact. This document was inferior. Well, based on what? According to what principle? I mean, if your principle is, I want the central government to be able to carry out its wishes more efficiently, then yes, yes, that's right. It was, it was inferior. But, you know, it is possible that you could have a different value system. That is possible. And when I look at the shape the United States is in today, and I, I personally am, am, 
I have a lot of concerns, but I am overwhelmingly concerned with the foreign policy issue, which I just find the most grotesque thing of all. And I ask myself, if there hadn't been the centralization of the 1780s, would all the resulting political units, maybe they would have formed into three confederacies, or maybe they would have all stayed independent. Who knows? They certainly all wouldn't be going to war in Iraq in 2003. They certainly all wouldn't have been intervening in World War I and exacerbating every negative trend in Europe at that time. I mean, uh, the world would be quite different in, in, that, in those ways. And so I would say that, yes, there would have been some problems. That's true. That, for example, it's true that probably some of these states would have discriminated against the products and trade of other states. And so it would have taken a little time for the logic of free trade to work its way through. So that would not, not have been perfect. But neither way is perfect. I mean, look at the United States today. That is very, very far from perfection. So you have to ask yourself, which inconveniences would I prefer to put up with? And I would prefer to put up with a non-imperial society that, yes, has some problems, but not nearly what we have today. It's funny. I don't know how many people I've met who say, yeah, I like Ron Paul, but his foreign policy views are problematic. Yeah. I, oh, boy, boy, we got that. You even get that in – well, you're living in the United States now, Klaus. So that you're talking about Americans you talk to? Uh, mostly Americans, yes. Because I can't imagine Swedes thinking Ron's foreign policy is so bad. No. Swedes are actually fairly anti-imperialistic in that sense, I would say. Yeah, well, but I, you're right about the foreign policy thing, and yet, to me, that was his most attractive quality. Uh, not only because I agreed with it, but also the fearlessness with which he put it forward. There is no political candidate I'm aware of who has been consistently anti-interventionist. I mean, you had George McGovern, who was against a war that was taking place at the time, the Vietnam War, and of course, he was crushed in 1972. He only won one state. So uh, that didn't work for him, but he wasn't a consistent non-interventionist. Ron's philosophy was non-interventionism. And this, th as I say, there's no room on the three-by-five card for that position at all. And yet he put it forth in debates in which he knew he was going to be booed. And it was the opposite of what people wanted him to say. And he knew that he'd get more votes if he would shut up about it. And the party establishment, the Republican Party, would at least tolerate him more if he would shut up about it, and yet he refused to. So even if you disagree with him, you have to respect that. The somebody who is so principled and honest that even at his own personal expense, he's going to tell you his principles in the same way that he would go down to Florida where there is a large Cuban-American uh, population and say we need to reopen trade with Cuba. Or he would go to the most, one of the most conservative states in the Union, South Carolina, and when he's asked about the war on drugs, he wouldn't backpedal and say, maybe we need to ease up a little bit on criminalizing drugs, but of course the hard drugs are too dangerous. No, he just stood his ground and said, this is where I stand. I don't see how people wouldn't at least say, wow, you know, we sure could stand more people as honest as this guy. I don't, I don't understand why more people didn't say that. Mm -hmm. uh, nope, I would rather have somebody who's going to speak to me in third grade level slogans. That's what I want. <laughs> yeah, That's all we get, isn't it? I, I mean... Political leaders, wherever they are, they seem to think that we are third graders. I just, I think they speak the language they know. I think they are third graders, <laughs> mostly. Well, they're third grade I mean, teachers. Yeah, they themselves are not particularly bright, but also they're doing what the polls tell them to do. That people respond well to slogans, and they don't respond well to, you know, let's say being told they're wrong on something, <laughs> which is what Ron is implicitly saying, but. Uh, of course, he tried to couch it by saying, look, most of the American people agree with me, but unfortunately, not as many Republicans agreed, uh, which is too bad. And, and it was in many of those uh, races, only Republicans were allowed to vote. And considering that, he did pretty well, considering that he's, he's got to appeal to the, if I may be perfectly blunt here, the most unreasonable part of the electorate. And, and I mean, I, I know there's a lot of competition for that, but these oldsters who are going to make their way into that voting booth to vote for more war if it's the last thing they do cannot be reached and yet he just kept on doing it and kept on doing it tom what about history as a topic why is that important and uh, what's the connection to liberty and uh, austrian economics would you say 
All right. Well, make sure I don't. I'm kind of scatterbrained lately, so make sure I don't forget the second part of your question. In fact, I'm going to write it down. Liberty slash Austrian. All right. Now I've forgotten the first part of the yeah. question. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. Now, history is important for a number of reasons, one of which is the one identified by F.A. Hayek in one of the, my favorite writings of his, the introduction he wrote to a book called Capitalism and the Historians in the 1950s. This was a series of book chapters on the Industrial Revolution. And Hayek opened it by saying that, of course, if we get history wrong, if we misunderstand history or we adopt a faulty understanding of history, then we're going to form the wrong opinions about the present and what should be done now. So, for example, if we have a faulty understanding of the history of big business in the United States in the 19th century, that's going to influence our decisions today about antitrust policy, government intervention, and so on and so forth. Uh, if we think that the, the unhampered free market yields you low wages and poor working conditions because we think that's what history teaches us, we're going to be in trouble again because we're going to make the wrong decisions in the present. And I think that's certainly true. And of course, in the U.S., th there is an official version of history. And in that version of history, centralization, once again, is progressive and intervention is progressive and everything else is backward and stupid. The laissez-faire uh, economic system is backward and stupid because we all know that people lived in terrible conditions during those times. Of course, this is a, a logical fallacy. The real reason they lived in terrible conditions was that the entire society was poor. That's why it's not because the rich people were wickedly depriving them of all the luxury goods. It was that the economy was too physically unproductive to produce enough luxury goods for everybody. But now that we've had all this capital investment, we can afford to buy more goods because the goods are less expensive because they're in such abundance. We can produce so many of them now. But this is not the way things are explained in the typical textbook. And so I've actually been able to make, in effect, kind of a, just a career out of challenging the conventional wisdom on history. And it's, you know, I, I would be happy if people began to understand the correct version of history, and, and I would be quite happy to go and do something else for a living. But so long as people are being taught this incorrect view, I'm quite happy to go around uh, correcting it. So I would say that's the main reason that history matters. But of course, also, I, I think uh, one of my friends says, why is it important to know the classics? And his answer was, so as not to be an ignorant barbarian. <laughs> and, and there is I something can, to that. <laughs> you know, I mean, like, yeah, I can really, very much agree with that. Uh, yeah, like we should know something about where we came from. And not just us in a, a narrow chauvinistic sense, but in a broader sense of our whole civilization. We really should know what its origins are and what its principles were that it believed in and what the great ideas were that have been debated over the centuries. Uh, th these things are, are what make Western man who he is, and not to know about them is, is very tragic. And I will say that the work that I did for Ron Paul's homeschool program, is, and by the way, that would make you a fascist, wouldn't it, to be educating your children outside the official government channels. But Not only that, it would make you a criminal in Sweden. Uh, I, no doubt, no doubt. So I, but what I've done in uh, over here in the U.S., Ron has started his own kindergarten through twelfth grade uh, homeschool program, and but it, it, it's not just history and economics; it has math and science and the and literature and the, the topics you would expect. But unlike all these schools in the U.S., where you would get about you would get one year of Western civilization, we do two years of Western civilization. Two full years of Western civilization. And guess who teaches those courses? You are listening to him. So it's 180 videos per course because it's 36 wow. weeks, five lessons per week. So you can do the math at how many videos I did on Western civilization. I did a course on government. And I enjoyed doing it because I, I used to teach Western civilization to college students. But when you're doing two full years of it, you, know, you do have to look some things up that you didn't know before. And it was a great experience for me, even though it was totally exhausting and crushed my spirit because it was so much work. But these students are going to know, they're going to know names like Plato and Aristotle are not just going to be names to them. And Augustine and Aquinas are not just going to be names to them. And the Renaissance is not just going to be a bunch of paintings to them. And they're going to learn this stuff day by day. And I've gotten emails from students. These are kids who are 15 years old saying, I can't believe how much I learned. Uh, I'm not going to be an ignorant barbarian. 
you know, this is something I can do instead of just cursing the darkness. And this is one of the great liberating things about the internet, not just that it spreads ideas, but it spreads your ability to affect the world, that you don't just have to be dejected and discouraged. You can get your camera turned on and you can record something and you can write something and you can make your contribution to 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 the world and it's it's a it is a liberating thing because it liberates you from despair and discouragement i'm going to go off script here a bit uh, and i have to i wasn't going to ask this question but i think i have to since you're talking about western civilization do you think there is hope for liberty and western civilization uh, i mean in the long run or is it are we all doomed well, I think there has to be hope for it in the long run if our message is correct. If our message really is correct, then our system works better and theirs doesn't. And eventually, this will become more and more obvious, whether it's through fiscal crises or the boom-bust cycle becomes more severe. There's been nothing, not Hayek winning the Nobel Prize, nothing that has spread more interest in the Austrian theory of the business cycle than the downturn that we experienced in 2008. And it seems to me those are bound to continue, and they continue to be teaching moments that we wouldn't have had otherwise because the Austrian theory of the business cycle is not on the three-by-five card, so it would not be covered in the major newspapers. But now a lot more people are interested in it or giving it a fair hearing. So these are good things. Then there are different ways in which technology is doing things that we've been told only the state can do. And I, I uh, have somebody coming on my show next week who talks about, for example, I don't know probably this is only a United States thing, but we have a, a smartphone app and a web-based app called Yelp. And Yelp is where you can get reviews of any restaurant or bar. or I mean, for all I know, it's all kinds of attractions. I use it only for restaurants that you might encounter. And so as you're driving along, you can use Yelp and say, all right, I'm in an unfamiliar area. Let me see how the restaurants are. And you can get immediately, you can get reviews, impartial reviews that the, the, the restaurant cannot have deleted. And so immediately you can know the quality, the cleanliness, the, all these sorts of things that we're told, well, because you lack the relevant information, you can't make an informed consumer decision. So this is a market failure. So we need the government to step in. None of these things hold water anymore. Or well, the reason that the government has to regulate the taxi cab industry is because how are you going to know the safety of a particular driver or a particular car? Well, with Uber, you can know that. You can immediately see the, the record, the reviews of people who have driven with this particular person. So the rationales that are being given for the state are falling by the wayside increasingly. So I do think that there is reason to think that in the long run, given that in the past we had no hearing and the establishment had a monopoly, whereas now the establishment is still loud and clear uh, they have their websites too, but we had nothing before, whereas now we have the Mises Institute and we have uh, all kinds of outlets and blogs and videos popping up all the time, that we are disproportionately benefited by this liberating effect of technology. So it doesn't solve all problems, but it gives us reason to think that with the passage of time, we might be able to see some progress. We have an interesting... Um situation in the liberty movement in Sweden. I, th I think when the Mises Institute came in Sweden almost five years ago, I think we, had, we changed things a little bit. Uh, but the liberal movement in Sweden is fairly uh, anti-religion. You've written a book on how the Catholic Church built Western civilization. Can you just say a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, now that book... The, the thesis of that book is developed in quite a number of chapters. And I think by the end, I just don't think it's even debatable anymore. I, I get people who look at the title and then they denounce me as a traitor to the cause. Don't you know the church did X, Y, and Z? Oh, you don't say, really? I'm a, a historian and I don't know about those things? That's not what the book is saying is that so many aspects of what we take to be foundational to Western civilization actually are not coming from ancient Greece and Rome. Uh, they're, they're coming from the church or influences that, that go back to the church. So even something as simple as what we think of as charitable behavior and charitable activity, the idea that you would do something for somebody else without expectation of reciprocity and without calling undue attention to yourself would have been viewed 
as absolute insanity in ancient Greece and Rome. This would have made no sense. And certainly the idea that I'm going to help, I'm going to pray for and help my enemies would have been just viewed as, as insane. In fact, that's why Pacomius, the Roman soldier, wound up converting to Christianity because he thought, how is it that the people we are persecuting are helping us at a time of uh, pestilence? How could that be? And so I have to look into these people. They're crazy. So, so that's just one small thing, because today, if you talk about charitable behavior, that's exactly what you have in mind. Non-reciprocal giving is, is what you have in mind. Well, where did that come from? Did that come from ancient Greece and Rome? No, it did not. And so what I'm showing is that in case after case after case, uh, even the sciences, but that would be a whole separate episode. That's the longest chapter in the book, and that's the most controversial. It's not controversial among historians of science, by the way. Historians of science have known what I'm saying in the book for 60 years. Uh, but what most people know is the Enlightenment caricature. What most people know is that everything the church touched became backward and superstitious and stupid and anti-progress and all that. And the earth was flat. And the earth was flat. Yeah, it's so crazy, <laughs> especially the, the flat earth thing. I, I mean, nobody believed the earth was flat. Like, that is a completely fabricated thing. Like, there's no historian who's going to buy into, no professional historian who's going to buy into that, uh, certainly anymore. But so it's taken hundreds of years, for example, to figure out that the development of economics really began with the late scholastic theologians. It did not just emerge out of Adam Smith's head. Now, why did it take so long to figure that out? Partly because everybody already knew the answer. We already know. We don't have to bother because certainly nothing the church touched could possibly be worth anything. So we don't even have to look. And so therefore, the progress of, of our historical understanding was retarded by this prejudice, this deeply embedded prejudice. Now, look, th th there's, there's no getting around the fact that, th that churchmen have been guilty of tremendous enormities, moral enormities over the centuries. No, there's, no, there's absolutely no, no denying that. Uh, that's certainly true. But none of these things are absolutely fundamental to the church's nature. If you look at in, in early church history, for example, you find that for example, the advice being given to people with regard to whether you should join the army is pretty much that, that a Christian just can't do something like that. Now, much, much later, you get all these uh, rationales for why it's perfectly okay. And of course, today in the United States, the most Christian thing you can do is join the army. But the record is quite clear that there's nothing fundamental to Christianity that says that you have to believe that. You certainly do not. And likewise, the idea of executing somebody because he disagrees with you on this, this is certainly not the case. Uh, I mean, Augustine was not a small figure in the history of Western Christianity. And he made he said, look, I mean, I, I was a notorious heretic for years. And I'm certainly glad I was given a chance to see the error of my ways and come into the faith. So I'm not in any way bound to these things. And moreover, church officials have said, well, obviously— just about everybody knows that none of those things should have happened. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't right wrongs. But as I say, this is obviously not fundamental to the nature of what the faith is all about. As I say, given that early on, we don't, we don't see these particular teachings. And moreover, I was particularly struck by a statement by Pope Benedict XVI, who, of course, everybody, all fashionable opinion hated him. All fashionable opinion hated him. He was terrible. We all love Pope Francis. Now, libertarians maybe don't love Pope Francis because of, he's so confused. Because he's on, a pope. Well, yeah, because he's a pope, of course. But even worse, he's, he's, uh, he's not good on economics. So, so that, that would be another thing. There have been popes who have been better on economics than, than Francis. But Benedict XVI, when he was still Cardinal Ratzinger, basically said in talking about just war theory, he basically said that it's – pretty much impossible to conceive of a just war today because of the conditions of modern warfare. It's pretty much impossible to imagine any war satisfying those requirements. Now, that's harder core than pretty much anybody but Ron Paul in the entire U.S. to take a position as hardcore as that. Uh, basically, there's nobody who takes a position like that. So we look at that. We look at, uh, as I say, if you look at the late scholastics who not only really began the science of economics, but who were also pretty darn free market when you look at the way they tr there's a book on this called faith and liberty that i reviewed uh i can send you the link to that uh, that review that shows that these people
believe when you, when it comes to monopoly or prices or wages or uh, whatever types of things, the guilds. They were consistently laissez-faire. I mean, pretty darn consistently laissez-faire for the 16th century. And nobody knows about that. No, nobody knows a thing about that. But they should because these people, uh, these people, in fact, in, in, in their value theory, for instance, avoided the errors that Adam Smith and David Ricardo would later make. You know, that's not a small thing. Yeah, um, I have time is really flying here, but I thought I'd try a question to sum things up which sort of falls into this. I mean, libertarians, some libertarians, especially in Sweden, generally dislike authority. But of course, most of us dislike illegitimate authority. But is there, I mean, we have to accept to some degree that there are uh, legitimate authorities. I mean, some people dislike the Pope because there shouldn't be a Pope. But I mean, even in a libertarian world, there will be some sort of authority. It just won't be the state, if you understand what I mean. Yeah, and I think this helps to account for some of the differences among libertarians and some of the different reasons that people come to the libertarian movement. As some, for some people, indeed, it is a, an anti-authoritarian streak. And, and when I say authoritarian, well, I just mean an anti-authority streak, maybe is what yeah. I should say. They, they don't like being told what to do by anybody. Now, that's perfectly fine. I mean, I don't think anybody particularly likes being told what to do, but there is all the difference in the world between an authority you voluntarily recognize and one that is forced on you. Uh, for instance, if you had a libertarian group and somebody's in charge of it who says, uh, you know, we've decided we're going to have the monthly dinner over at this restaurant, uh, I think most of us would think that was fairly benign. There's no problem with that. Or if you have a chess club and you have a president of the chess club, it would be just obnoxious to say, well, pff, nuts to you. I don't care what you say. I'm not going to do the en passant rule in my games. Well, <laughs> yeah, then go start your own darn club. <laughs> but for, for something to function, you do need to have some authority. For example, even the very rules of chess are an authority. Yeah. Or, I mean, if you don't have that authority, you can't play the game. So there is no problem with authority, especially voluntarily recognized authority. This is such an elementary distinction. Libertarians get upset when statists won't make elementary distinctions. Statists will point to, I, I know statists who point to the Federal Reserve and say, ah, oh, there's capitalism for you. What? <laughs> the Federal Reserve was created by the government. It has government privileges. What does it have to do? So There's even a, a sort of free market guy, Richard Posner. I think it's Richard Posner. For, I hope it's not. I think, yeah. And, and he wrote a book about how the free market really did cause the financial crisis. And people said, well, what about the Federal Reserve? And he said, well, the Federal Reserve really is part of capitalism. So, and, and we libertarians get all upset about that. Can't you distinguish between crony capitalism and capitalism? Can't you distinguish between a government institution and a market institution? And then we have the very same libertarians turn around. And they can't make a distinction between different kinds of authority when this is the whole point. The whole point of libertarianism is coercive behavior versus voluntary. And it, it, it doesn't affect you in any way if I voluntarily accept the authority of somebody else. It's, it's my choosing. And, and if I suddenly stop accepting that person's authority, nothing happens to me. I might not be allowed into that particular club, but according to you, I shouldn't want to be in that club anyway. This is a big problem because I, my view, I, I'm basically pretty old fashioned in my views of a lot of things. I've got five kids. Uh, my wife drives a minivan. <laughs> you know, we, we, we live a fairly bourgeois life, and you know our views are fairly bourgeois and traditional. And so I believe in tradition, and I, you know, and I don't see any compatibility with that. I see the state as undermining me at every turn. The state is trying to fill my kids' heads with nonsense. The state is making it more difficult for them to find jobs. I feel like the state is at war with me, and I want to try to fight against that, but. I don't see that that is an assault on all forms of authority, just forms of authority that are oppressing me and that I never consented to. I, that seems like such an elementary distinction to me. Tom, can I ask you just one final personal question? How libertarian are you? <laughs> I'm so libertarian. That's an American. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I, I'm th I think we're going to have to let you go. Um, Let's oh, wait a minute. Wrong. He asked me that? <laughs> no, no, he has to answer the question first. No, I mean, look, I'll, I'll say that, uh, at, at least from a theoretical standpoint, I'm willing to entertain the possibility that we could organize ourselves on a purely voluntary basis and that the traditional 
a view of subsidiarity that you see in Christian social thought that, well, you know, we, uh, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't assign a task to a higher political authority than is absolutely necessary. I think if you take that to its logical conclusion, we don't have to assign any task to any political authority. And if they're going to come back at me and say, well, now, wait a minute, hold on a minute, that's not what we had in mind. You have to have some monopoly somewhere. Well, then that's like Henry Ford saying, you know, you can have your car any color you like as long as it's black. If you're really going to say that, you know, the, the church does not uh, take a position on which particular political system you should have, well, then I, I think we should take them at their word uh, in case anybody was going to raise that particular objection. But I, I, I think I've just gotten to the point where I don't see how anybody can be trusted with minimal political authority and how it could be kept that way and not become maximal political authority. So I think the best way is not to start and instead to teach people basic moral principles about not stealing, not killing, not hurting people. That's much easier than saying, okay, here are the merits of limited government and you got to give them a you know 30-week seminar on why government should have only three, these functions rather than those functions. How about just teaching them a few basic ideas? I think that's far more likely to stick in the long run, but I, I highly doubt this will come to pass so I would certainly just like to see any reductions of government that I can possibly see. But, you know, I'm, I'm willing to entertain the possibility that the political leaders are actually unnecessary after all. You get to recommend one book before we let you go. Uh, well, to an American audience, it would be a different book than to a Swedish one. Uh, to an American audience, it would definitely be Ron Paul's book, The Revolution a Manifesto, because it, it, I think, gets people started very, very quickly on these ideas. In terms of a more general book that might have general appeal, well, maybe in this case I would go with Hans Hermann Hoppe, uh, H-O-P-P-E, simply because he does talk about some European history. So maybe Democracy, the God that Failed, or I know it sounds really boring, but I promise you it is the, one of the most intellectually exhilarating books you'll read, The Economics and Ethics of Private Property. Boy, when I was in college, that book just blew me away. Thank you. Yeah. Um, a big thanks to you, Tom, for taking the time to talk to us for this hour. It's been truly amazing. We, we hope we get to talk to you at some time in the future, whenever you have time. I've enjoyed it myself. Thank you very much. Yeah. And also, we're great fans of your writing. And we have to sort of finish up by saying that. I've read most of your books. It's, it's, Thank you. It's great that there are actually libertarian historians. Well, I'm doing my best. I wish there were more. Yes, we need more, always more. Thank you so much, Tom, for coming to our little show. Oh, can I, before I go, can I just mention uh, TomWoods.com is my website. That's the home of my daily show that apparently all your fellow Swedes are listening to. So you really owe it to yourself to, to go check it out. Yes, and also your uh, Liberty Classroom. LibertyClassroom.com is, is uh, my other site that's also linked at TomWoods.com where you can learn all the history and economics not on the 3 by 5 card. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, Tom. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, gentlemen. Bye-bye.